Dick Fold, the CEO of Lehman Brothers, was called the gorilla by fellow executives. He was an aggressive weightlifter, and he would scream in the boardroom. If you go to YouTube, you can see videos of him screaming, trying to point the finger away from Lehman Brothers for their sins in the 2008 financial crisis. He screams about investors shorting his company, blaming them for the collapse, not the banks. He screams at subordinates who can't follow orders. More than anything, he screams about how unfair the government was for bailing out the other banks, but not bailing Lehman. When Dick Fold screams, the veins on his neck pop out. He has a wide forehead, deep dark eyes, and a voracious appetite. Senior executives used to bring him a plate of ribs for his mid-morning snack, which according to those same executives, never made Dick fat, because he'd burn off those calories with intensity. Dick Fooled also seemed fully capable of hurting you if you disagreed with him. One former executive talking to New York Mag said, quote, through these little physical cues, he made it seem like a situation would lead to physical violence if he didn't relent. Usually when we think of charisma, we think of charm, magnetism, a winning smile and a warm handshake. But charisma can also be persuasiveness, the ability to browbeat the ship and its crew into action. Steve Jobs' charisma came from his wit, which he used to turn Apple into a powerhouse. Specifically, Jobs was persuasive. He knew how to use rhetoric, and he was the master of Aristotle's tools of persuasion. He was able to get subordinates moving in the direction he wanted. That's the hidden dark side of charisma. Every company desperately desires a charismatic CEO, because if you're lucky enough to get a Steve Jobs, they'll steer your ship into money and everyone will follow. But if you get a dick fooled, someone who was, by all accounts, very charismatic, they'll stare for the rocks. And guess what? Everyone will follow. In other words, if you're headed towards success, a charismatic leader will get your people paddling there faster. But if you're already successful and the 800 pound gorilla wants to veer into failure, your people will paddle there too. Or into a national bank and housing collapse, as was the case with Dick Fooled, our very charismatic CEO. You're listening to The Reengineered You. This is a podcast about self-empowerment and all the myths, lies, and misconceptions we tell ourselves. Then we use science and history to bust those myths and re-engineer a better you. I'm your host, Todd Laments, The Extrovert. And I'm the writer, researcher, and introvert, Joe Anthony, whose job it is to dig through the outer layer of no-duh on the internet and get to the facts. Whether we like to admit it or not, we are all in sales. Parents have to sell their kids and their achievements to get them into private schools. Employees have to sell their skills to get better jobs. High school star athletes have to sell themselves to the right college by submitting clips of themselves almost weekly. Single people online have to sell themselves the hardest, one might argue, by crafting the perfect dating profile. In short, we're all in sales, and the person who sells themselves the hardest gets to be the president or whatever they want. So what's the universal language for selling yourself? That's what we're here to find out on this two-part episode about charisma. In this episode, episode one will bust our biggest myth about charisma. Myth one. Why is the world one big popularity contest? We'll go all the way back to ancient roots to find out. How did humanity survive following aggressive tribal leaders like Dick Fooled? And why do we still follow Dick's? when there are plenty of more qualified leaders out there. Then, in episode two, we'll cover our other myths, like myth two. Can we outsell ourselves against the competition? Is charisma a learnable skill? And where do we pick up those skills? And finally, myth three. Do we even need charisma as modern humans? In a society governed by statistics, internet, AI, and data, do we still need persuasive hotheads telling us what to do? 
Okay, so our first episode about charisma is really just all about um, something I've heard historians call the great man uh, theory or great man paradox or, you know, great man vacuum. It's the idea that every tribe actually needs to have a leader, that you need to have this charismatic, chest-thumping, you know, point in a single direction and lead you into the horizon uh, kind of leader. Captain the chief. Yeah, we, we need a chief, we need a captain, um, we need a dick. Um, <laughs> Isn't it so, ironic that that's his name is Dick? I that's You're going to see me giggling and smiling through this entire two-part episode. Just every time we talk about... I, I, it's such a dick move. Why can't he just say Richard or Rick? You know, <laughs> <there's> so much... <laughs> Especially with how badly things went for the economy. Um, so where where do we start? Where do we... If if we're looking at our chief here, where where does our chief's life begin? Well, the re-engineered you were big history people. We go back to when they were young. And Dick Fuld, the CEO, President Lehman Brothers, started out. Um, I dug and dug on his life. All I know is that he was a rich kid. Okay. Most of his people around him and senior management and Lehman Brothers was not, though. They weren't the Ivy Leaguers. They weren't the Silver Spoon kids. He had money, but he didn't go off to the big schools. He actually went to University of Colorado for his bachelor's, which does not usually lead to leading a financial institution on Wall Street. Yeah, no no diss on the University of Colorado, but when I see Ivy League lists, I don't usually see them at the top. I think that's what I meant by big. Yeah. <laughs> was prestigious universities. <laughs> right. I was expecting you to say Harvard or Yale when you were talking about Dick Fold. And that's where most of those people go to who end up at that level. Um, he, he joined, he went to New York University Stern School of Business for his MBA. And as soon as he got out, he had one job. He was a commercial paper trader at Lehman Brothers. Okay. So he was basically raised in the institution. He was. And for him, this wasn't just getting a job and getting a paycheck. From day one, he was 100% bought in. He was where he wanted to be. This is what did he want to do. Now, he's joined an institution that's 150 years old. So Lehman Brothers was in Dick's blood. And everyone that worked with him in the early years all said the same thing about him. And you heard it over and over. He's smart and he's intense. Okay. I wonder, I'm just going to speculate here. Can I imagine like a movie scene where like a smart, super intense kid is like sitting at a bus terminal and he runs into one of the Lehman Brothers, kind of like Tom Hanks and Leo DiCaprio. You, we've watched too many movies. I'm sorry. But, yes, I have. <laughs> let me tell you a little about the Lehman Brothers. The Lehman Brothers started in at Montgomery, Alabama, in 1844, and it was three brothers: Henry Emanuel and Meyer Lehman, and they were trading cotton for goods. And that's how they started their investment bank. <laughs> that is so wild. Like Montgomery, when you see, Alabama. Yeah, when you see the building, uh, when you look up articles about Lehman Brothers, and it's this huge building with the with the name splashed across the outside, and these offices that crumbled the United States, and you just think these are a couple of brothers who were just trading cotton. Now, Joe is an investment. He has an investment. He does some some stocks in this and that real estate. They wouldn't let you use the bathroom in this place, Joe. <laughs> yeah, they, they would have told me, uh, go down the street to another bank. Go to Bank of America. They'll let you uh, use their restroom. Go to Chase. So Lehman, before its collapse, was the fourth largest investment bank in the country. So here's the big ones. Merrill, Morgan Stanley, and Goldman Sachs were bigger. Lehman Brothers... Towards the end, 2008, the crash had 25,000 employees worldwide and had been in business for 158 years. That is a long way to fall. To, yeah, to out of business. Yeah. Um, if anybody ever questions, I, I mean, if, if you're listening to this episode and you are, um, you haven't heard of Lehman Brothers, um, you're not alone. I knew of them. I mean, I'll ask Todd too. Uh, I knew of them as 
one of five names on a, a list of banks that I had never gone to. Um, I had heard more about Goldman and Sachs just because of political news than I had heard about Lehman Brothers. Um, honestly, because they're not the the people banks like that. Actually, that is. Can I be childish and be like, there's people banks and there are um, rich people banks. The people banks in my mind are <laughs> Bank of America, Bank of the West, uh, Chase, like ones that I can go to, me, um, and open an account. These are, you know, like company banks. These are these are banks that wouldn't have us. And so to my mind, I was just like, oh, they're they're nebulous investors they are you know buildings on clouds in the sky yeah joe thinks he can get his like mickey mouse debit card there so is this where i come to get my (laughs) right (laughs) and then security escorts me out this is people throwing around billions of dollars like we tip at starbucks yeah I, i think the the way that one might think of it Um, these are the financial institutions that do business with the banks that I go to. So like if I have an account somewhere, that bank is doing high volume business with these people. So, um, that might be a a better way to look at it. And dealing with credit lines that we can't even comprehend and creating industries and bailing out other industries. And it's a very complicated business. There's a reason investment bankers make a million dollars a year. Right. But these these five together were the pillar of the United States financial institution and um, uh, specifically Lehman Brothers was the oldest. They were um, the most aggressive um, and they they held, it seems like, the most cards. You talked about aggressive. How do they pick people to work in that aggressive atmosphere? How do they find the right fit? Okay, so. When I was making the joke about uh, where's our movie about Lehman Brothers finding Dick, finding him at a bus stop. By the way, there's no way they found him at a bus stop. But Rolls uh, Royce chauffeur, more likely. Right. They probably just, you know, he he had a. You know, I hate to fall on nepotism, but oftentimes it's like do you have a relation, and then you're introduced to you know somebody who runs the institution. Um, you know, word trickles up that you are an up and coming uh, math prodigy, and then suddenly you're leading a business. Um, as we found out in classism, uh, oftentimes job interviews and introductions to people is, say, like an introduction to Lehman Brothers or an interview at Lehman Brothers when you're still in high school getting good grades. Usually they're looking for a quote unquote good cultural fit. Um, we talk about office culture, uh, that oftentimes the classism is is more important than a legitimate skills assessment. I'm guessing that when Lehman Brothers uh, first met Dick, they were probably looking at uh, how he's going to lead their ship, what kind of attitude he has, does he come from the right socioeconomic background, I'm guessing if he had, um, say, been there on a poverty scholarship, uh, is a horrible way people put it, he probably wouldn't be the CEO. He would probably be maybe like one of their accountants. Well, to get into trying to understand and get my head around this, like you said, trying to understand this level of bank, I was watching some things about internship at Goldman Sachs, and it was showing um, you know, some 4.0 Ivy League kids who exchange students who were working 90 hour weeks in an internship to get their foot in the door. Right. <laughs> so it it just so happens, pure luck, we are recording this episode while Goldman Sachs is undergoing um, a petition. Their youngsters, their their first year bankers and their first year accountants are currently leading a rebellion um, during COVID, during this um, labor shortage. They're, they're currently leading a, um, a petition against the 90 to 100 hour work weeks that, that defines that company for first year people. Um, so we're going to have that in an episode coming up about saying no and how to say no to, you know, work. Um, Dick Fueled 
would eat those kids for his break, for his lunch, for his <laughs> breakfast snack. <laughs> if they started that shit <laughs> at so, Lehman Brothers. <laughs> this is the secret sauce. We're talking about, you know, what makes charisma. People think it's, you know, charisma is being friendly, smiling at somebody, giving them a handshake, making them feel warm when they arrive at your dinner party. I'm learning that charisma is being dick fold. It's being aggressive. It's being persuasive. It's being this quote unquote tribal leader. And it would mean taking these kids who want to work 60 hour weeks through how dare them not want to work, you know, 100 hours a week. And cracking their heads together like coconuts and telling them get back to work and, and having them believe it, have them actually follow that. Um, when when we started working on this episode, charisma, uh, what did you think of uh, when you thought of charisma as a skill? I think of that charming, um, how do you say it, like that cruise ship host. Oh, you, you know, you get on and they know exactly what to say and you're with them and they're warm and they're confident and you trust them right away. And if they told you what this going to do, you'd believe them. Right. That I, I think you said it warmth, believability, um, the ability to rally troops. Oftentimes when I thought of charisma, I thought of benevolent leadership, that somebody who's charismatic is like Ben Franklin, like they're not you know, busting heads and, and whipping butt. They are they are coming up behind you, putting their arm around you and, and telling you, you know, big brother to little brother, this is what we should do for the company because it's best. But uber intelligent and uber competent. Yeah, yeah, that, that, they, that they have the mind to back up that warmth. Okay, so let's, let's rewind the clock just a tiny bit because I want to I wanna get to why we as people react to dick like like you and i we're being very glib and jokey um but honestly if a dick fold came to us and was like you guys are doing it wrong here's how to run your podcast you know here's here's how to and started giving us a actual wisdom but did it in a hyper aggressive way i like to pretend i wouldn't react to that but you know reality and and numbers tell me that I would, that if Dick Fold were in the room with us right now, we probably would do whatever he said. He'd leash us up like little puppies and we'd do whatever he said. We want to please him. Right. He'd be disappointed in us. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we would not want to disappoint Dick. Um, so um, if you have heard of the book Sapiens, um, there's a writer, uh, Yuval Noah Harari, and he theorizes that humans came together and came to dominate the world because we can cooperate. So there's a lot of like uh, thoughts that early man dominated the planet because they had thumbs or that we had, you know, intelligence that we were making water wheels and and, you know, weapons with levers and triggers, you know, long before any other creature. That's not really true. Um, Neanderthals had spears. We had spears. Uh, other versions of proto-human had spears too. We were all basically on a level playing field. The difference is, um, you know, we were under well, like we were underwhelming as a species. Um, we had, you know, these dull little teeth. We had no claws. We were not that strong. Um, if you look at Neanderthals, which were, we were competing with, we were found in caves with them. Like you can find Neanderthal skulls in the same cave. You will find human skulls, except they were stronger. They were faster. Uh, they reached maturity quicker. Um, I'm going to go back to my nerd roots and be like, these guys were like orcs. They were a version of human, but they were just like better than us in almost every way except one tiny detail. Um, they could actually, uh, um, you know, they could outdo us on the open field, track and field, uh, but we were able to talk to each other better. We socialized, we organized, we traded, we, we grouped up, we, you know, we mated, we, we made bonds, uh, you know, tribe to tribe. That is something Neanderthals did not do as well, or any other proto-human, really. Sounds like the TV show Survivor. 
Yeah, it kind of does. Kind of manipulated um, them. If, if I think I know where you're going. Yeah. Um, we, we, of course, mated with Neanderthals, and we traded with them, too. But that's kind of what we did best. There wasn't a, um, an out-and-out war between Neanderthals and humans. If anyone thinks this is going to end in a Game of Thrones-style war against the White Walkers, um, no, it's it's we outbred, out-traded, and out-maneuvered Neanderthals just globally, not as a effort. It's not like we were trying to beat them. That was just in our nature to to be better organized. Um, do you remember the episode where we talked about uh, Dunbar's number? Oh, yeah. How many people you can hold in your head? 150? Right. Yeah. Um, you know, primates uh, across the board, they are able to sort of conceive of a social number. If you have a maximum of um, of 150 friends or people in your head before you start forgetting names and faces, if you ever do that exercise where you, you try to think of somebody you went to high school with and you realize you have forgotten both their name and their face, you just sort of vaguely remember the guy you sat across from in biology, um, that means that person did not make your 150 person Dunbar number cut. 156, 157. Right. So you you basically can only keep up with about 150 people, roughly. Um, But here's what a charismatic person can do for you. Um, If you have a dick fold, a chief come up to you and say, hey, you know, you're not just a primitive man surviving out here on the African savanna. You... You are part of a team. You know, I'm Dick Fold. I, I'm, I'm ancient chief Dick Fold. Um, and we are part of the Red Tribe. Uh, we identify ourselves by a banner that is streaked with blood. And, you know, we're highly aggressive. I eat ribs for breakfast. Follow me. Um, suddenly, instead of identifying, you know, if, if Dick Fold's tribe, uh, his, his, his ancient Lehman tribe is more than, you know, what was it, um, 25,000 people? Yeah, if Dick Fold's ancient Lehman tribe is 25,000 people, your primitive man brain would be like, I can't possibly learn all these people. Well, you don't have to. If you identify yourself by a team or a tribe or a nation, that occupies one space in your 150 number. So... You don't have to learn everyone's name, everyone's personality. You don't have to infinitely expand your Dunbar number. All you have to say is, I'm under this banner. Um, you know, I am, I am team, uh, you know, I'm team Arsenal. Uh, I follow the Raiders. I'm a Patriots fan. I'm a Republican or Democrat. Uh, I am, you know, part of the, the uh, loincloth washer tribe. Whatever your banner is, you no longer have to do a Dunbar number. You no longer have to learn every name and every person in that tribe. You have to learn one thing, and it's very easy to follow that. And that's a huge connector. It makes you feel secure and safe, right? Right. Does it help if that lead person, man or woman, is so extreme and so dangerous and so aggressive? Does any part of us, Joe, think... I'll be safer if I'm on their side. I'll have more resources because they're going to be out front fighting for me. We we, we have talked about um, confidence on this show. Um, the show. By the way, I, I <laughs> this this charisma episode, this episode has been a long time in the making. We have talked charisma on all many many of our prior episodes. So if it sounds like this is almost like a clips episode where we are looking back at prior, um, you know, re-engineered you uh, sessions. It is because um, we are basically looking at the making of a charismatic leader. And to do that, um, they have to do all these tricks. And yes, we, we look for that kind of a leader to do that. Um, do, you, do you remember our grudges episode, speaking of? Grudges. Refresh my memory. Um, that was our French balloon duel. Oh, you're, <laughs> yeah, we got a lot of people following that stories from all over the world. <laughs> I These love that two story. men in France, um, in Paris wanted to do it. They were 
fighting over a woman, and they wanted to duel it out. You know, duels old school. And they said, let's get in hot air balloons. Well, it was against the law to do it in the ground. So they said, okay, right. we won't do it on the ground. We'll do it in hot air balloons. <laughs> well, one of the, the things we talked about in that episode is that a good story, um, you don't have to have a grudge against your neighbor. You don't have to be the Hatfields and the McCoys. Um, you don't have to be wronged by somebody to have a grudge against them. What you can have happen very easily is somebody else tells you about their grudge and they make you feel the pain of it. Um, we've put people in functional MRIs and found that good storytelling makes somebody else's brain sync up with yours. So if I tell you that my neighbor you know, uh, murdered my dog, John Wick style, and spray painted my front door and did all these awful things you will have the same sort of rage that I have over it just by me telling a really compelling story. Dick Fold tells a compelling story. These primal tribal leaders, these, these, if you watch a video of Dick Fold screaming and his vein is popping and an outside watcher, somebody who looks at YouTube is like, what a monster. Of course, this guy is the villain of Wall Street. Of course, this guy led the financial collapse. But if you're on the inside, that is not a screaming lunatic leading your business. That is a guy who has gotten really good at telling you we're at war. You know, these people you've never heard of, they hate you. Um, somebody killed our dog and spray painted our front door. Now we're going to battle. And he rallies the troops and everybody, you know, follows the tribal leader and they, they go to war against the neighboring tribe. And that neighboring tribe happens to be a bank. And I think the narrative, he tells his own narrative to get him, to get his skills, to get that, to keep that power. And then he tells his exterior narrative to keep everybody to come along with him. Right. Have you ever, have you ever heard of the, um, the YouTube channel Charisma on Command? No, I've never heard of that. It's it's a really good channel. Um, when I went looking for um, basically the essence of charisma, what makes somebody charismatic, that channel came up over and over again in looking for you know research on YouTube. Um, <laughs> I know anyone that says that I research something on YouTube usually means they are an anti-vaxxer and they were watching wild videos. Um, no, I, I think this guy... A Charisma on Command breaks down stars and starlets and um, they break down people on television and they explain why these people are compelling to watch, why they're charismatic, thousands of techniques they cover. You know, they talk about eye contact, pauses, body language. But the one thing that shows up in their videos over and over again is charismatic people tell stories. They, they get you on their side. They hijack this network in your brain. They leave little signals in their story to remind you you're part of their tribe, that you're being included with them. Is, uh, is, is this borderline flirting, hinting with cult leaders again? <laughs> we can't do an episode without using the cult word. Um, I'm just going to uh, quote... There's a, a New York Times bestseller, uh, David Farland. He, he works on storytelling. And he talks about um, something called the kinesthetic cycle. Uh, and you can look this up. Um, it, it's, it's effectively story hypnosis. If you ever find yourself listening to an audiobook from anybody uh, on like Audible and you miss your bus stop or you are listening to an audiobook and you, your eyes glaze over and you're in the aisles of a bookstore. Um, if someone uses really good storytelling and they are descriptive and they use a lot of good metaphors and they, they use senses, they tell you how things smell, how they look, how they taste, um, they can hijack your brain, basically. Uh, you get into this trance and your brain goes from operating at like 17 hertz down to like 7 to 10 or something like that. And it, it's your brain starts accessing parts of your sensory information. So if I tell you that, you know, uh, there was the aroma of lilacs in the air 
and you know we were in the hospital and it was you know turns out it was a lilac flavored bleach that they had used on the floor and you know the all the instruments the metal tools were shiny and I, I get really detailed well your your brain starts accessing those parts of your your senses it, it stops working on you know whatever critical uh, thinking you were doing and it starts going to those senses well, when I think Dick Hmm? I think one of the great stories when you're talking about the first first person that popped into mind from American history was the very charismatic president Abraham Lincoln and his world renowned storytelling. Oh my God! Yes, um, yeah. That if you listen to um, Barack Obama has this speech where like he goes to respond to a hurricane and he uses the kinesthetic cycle immediately in his speech he says something to the effect of like you know i you know we heard you in washington i came to see the destruction myself a place once defined by color and sound the second line down the street the crawfish boils in backyards the the music always in the air suddenly it was dark and silent you know i i he 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 uses all the senses in less than two sentences and the world watched in horror we saw those rising waters drown the iconic streets of New Orleans. Families stranded on rooftops, bodies in the streets, children crying, crowded in the Superdome. He accesses those in his speech when he arrives. Um, Dick Fold, uh, our charismatic CEO, when you listen to him speak, he does the same thing. He talks about eating hearts. But what I really want to do because I want to reach in, rip out their heart, and eat it before they die. And, and like, you know, like the tasting blood, and, and he uses all these very primal, visceral cues. And, you know, it it's, sounds hyper-masculine and weird to delve into, but use primal tricks like this. Use, use storytelling. Um, but, so we can do this. We can study this. We can get this down. We absolutely can. Um, that is going to be the whole second half of, of our Charisma episode. We are going to talk about um, leadership storytelling. Um, we're going to cover um, how to incorporate good metaphor into your uh, persuasive arguments to become sort of a tribal leader. Some people might be asking, you know, why do I want to be a dick fold? you can choose the type of leader you're going to be. Um, in fact, if you do a TED Talk, you are choosing to be a type of storytelling tribal leader. I looked up an Atlantic article. Uh, it's called The Charisma Effect. And they talked about how uh, subjects who saw a TED Talk by a charismatic speaker, they gave more money to strangers than those who saw an uncharismatic TED Talks. That is so crazy to me that your charisma in one arena of life can ripple other people's actions to the point where they're giving more money after a decent TED Talk. Um, the Atlantic also says that, you know, thinking about a charismatic person versus, say, just an acquaintance also made people more likely to cooperate with a stranger. That last part there, that if that makes your uh, your skin crawl or your you know like a, a a tickle up your spine that a you know listening to a charismatic TED Talks can make you more likely to cooperate with strangers so it's not just that a good tribal a, a good charismatic leader it's not just that they can make you cooperate with them it hits a switch in your brain once they get you into that sort of hypnosis zone where they can access your senses for you, once they get you listening to what they, you know, what they would like you to help them with or do with them, you continue to be uh, pliable. You continue to be um, cooperative with other people after you've left their sphere, their presence. They tattooed you. They got you. Right. That is so wild to me. Um, You're contagious now. Yeah. So now I'm going to turn the tables. Uh, we're going to spin the revolver on the table or, or bottle or whatever. Um, Todd, I want to tell you that you have had this effect on people that you have met. Um, we very rarely uh, look across the table and accuse each other here at the Reengineered You. 
Um, but I've noticed that you do something that I envy. You tell these little anecdotes and these stories and these neat facts. And the way that translates to charisma is that um, we, we, during an episode, I gave Todd a compliment once saying that, you know, in the charisma myth, they say, you know, power plus warmth equals charisma. Power meaning you either have financial power or positional power in your job or you have power, you know, uh, physically. And then warmth just means, you know, uh, on a tribal level, they're being warm by sharing advice with you. They're being brotherly, big brother, you know, they they want to help you survive. The combination of I have power in this tribe, I want you to survive in this tribe, that is the fundamental part of charisma. That is charisma on a survival level. Todd does this. He will pull somebody aside and he will start sharing wisdom in the uh, his his version of wisdom is a short story. He will tell an anecdote from work, or he will tell you know uh, a truism or a parable, and it very much is sort of the Big Brother style wisdom. Thank. Uh, well, we've been working too, Joe, into all of our our content for presenting, for training, for our leadership training programs is to to build trustworthiness with people, not for manipulation's sake, but to be heard. So people know that they can trust you because they find that very, to work humor in. But the big thing and the basic thing we always try to teach, if we can teach anyone who's new, who's trying to get more charismatic, is to be what? Is to be warm and to be confident. Yes. Um, my version of that is a weaker version, I will have you know. I don't use that warm, you know, uh, sharing wisdom style of charisma in my own life. I pull people aside and I give them uh, facts and statistics and studies that I have encountered while researching for the show. That is a weaker version because I'm not telling them a story. I am usually sharing just bland, flat facts. Storytelling, if we're just talking pure charisma... Um, you know, the ability to get people to rally to your side. If you're saying, join my tribe, you don't have to learn everybody's name. You don't have to add to your Dunbar number, but you can get under our banner. Um, doing it with storytelling is far more effective than my technique, which is saying 90% of people benefit from joining my tribe. Which is crazy is you are the storyteller of this. <laughs> right. Couple. You are the professional award-winning writer. And I think a lot of it, too, is um, my worldly life. You've worked a desk job. You've been a writer, an introverted writer. And I've been out in sales situations and social situations and seen so much more live. Therein lies the difference. You have had to be charismatic with people in real life, in real time. I have spent my time researching and studying so I, I know the elements that go into storytelling. You have the experience in storytelling uh, when we talk about tribal charisma. Um, do you want to hit on a good point to a takeaway just for myself is to keep the stories what would you say short? Yes. Not the tell me go into that a little bit more. Short and rich. Um, I think the key that I can tell. Uh, from what I've read, and we're going to get into this more in this, the next episode, um, use emotionally compelling components. So, you know, when Barack Obama shows up, he immediately says, this is a disaster, a, a literal actual disaster. Um, he talks about hearing people's cries, their pleas, their, their you know, um, their current state. Um, so, Basically, he starts with where good stories start. He, he says, here are the stakes, and here's what I've heard, here's what I've seen, here's what I felt. Um, we're going to talk later about how to use uh, metaphor and how metaphor is the great binder of minds. You can be from any culture on earth. Everyone understands a good, simple metaphor. And we are definitely going to include that in our instructions in part two. Speaking of, of short stories that, that gets tribal people ready to go to war or ready to join a cause, do you want to hear a real mind blower about movies? Please. Okay. <laughs> Have you ever uh, seen the movie The 13th Warrior? No. Okay. 
It is a goofy, fun uh, romp. Uh, um, Antonio Banderas stars as an Arabic um, prince or, or like a, an emissary. And he runs into a bunch of Vikings. And these Vikings, um, you know, a, a, a boy arrives in their Viking village tells them that bear people are attacking them, uh, are, are murdering their, their Vikings in a faraway land, um, some outskirt village somewhere. And then an old woman who is like a fortune teller uh, tells them, hey, gather your warriors, get other Vikings on your side. Um, we're going to need you to go murder these, these bear people. And they grab... Antonio Banderas, this um, you know Middle Eastern emissary, they grab him and tell him, "You're gonna have to be a warrior too. Uh, we need we need a thirteenth man. He can't be a Norseman." And then they grab him, and they go fight Neanderthals. They're they're like these squat, big nose, big forehead, you know, pe- like. And when they they find out that they're not actual bears, they're dressed up in like bear fur. Um. The, the two wild parts of this. One, I found out it's a true story. So you watch this whole movie. It's, it's goofy. It's fun. It, it, it almost feels like Lord of the Rings, except they're fighting, you know, Vikings versus bear men uh, or, or, you know, weird squat, you know, pygmy men in, in fursuits. Um, come to find out, there is a book called Eaters of the Dead. It was written by Michael Crichton. And it was based on uh, actual documents written by a Middle Easterner that in real life met with Vikings. Most of the document is actually quite boring. I've read the book, by the way. Um, Easter of the Dead, a lot of it is just sort of the details of, you know, this guy was, was um, ba- Antonio Banderas' character. Um, he was effectively uh, counting their grain and their food and how far they travel and where they go. So a lot of it is based on real life. But the way the, um, the Viking leader tells this story, tells everybody that they have to go rally and, you know, kill off these bear men. Uh, once I was writing this episode, I know that I translate everything that we study into movies this really made me think of, you know, if we're talking tribal leaders who will gather a group of people, go to war uh, by telling a good story, um, outdo a, a what we're talking about, how humans extinguished other proto species of man early on. I, I realized while I was, you know, reading for this episode, we're basically ta- telling the story of the 13th warrior that, you know, this this stern angry face looking leader tells the story and gets everyone to follow him and i couldn't not help but think about dick fold as this like viking leader um so if you if you ever want to uh have fun on a saturday night watch the 13th warrior think oh my god the story is true uh eaters of the dead by michael crichton it, that's not a fictional book and then also think we are still susceptible to this type of tribal leadership. Somebody who is angry and browbeating us like a Viking, we yeah. will still follow that guy. With a great story. With a great story, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Dick seemed to, like, almost willfully sail their ship off a cliff. Um, like we'll, we'll get into exactly what happened in the history of his company, but he took their boat right into the rocks, uh, thinking every single minute that he was going to get bailed. Who did he bring with him? Because I know he had like, uh, people that his investors disagreed with. He basically started recruiting, you know, deplorables onto his side. How did he do that? Like, who did he grab? Well, this is how it started. And he did take Lehman down a very dark path. And what happens, Joe? How do we get these leaders who just their egos, they get out of control? They insulate themselves with people, right? Right. It's the cult leader who has, you know, the the moral enforcer as their right-hand person. They get callous to the fact. They get a little arrogant that they can never make any mistakes. So they started with the structure of the company. He had a guy that he started trading with and knew for many, many years. The guy's name was Joe Gregory. 
these two were so close, Joe, through 40 years in this company, their desks were never more than 100 feet away. I mean, they were buddy buddies. They were work buddies, work brothers. Okay. Now, Fool was the CEO, but it took him eight long years to make his buddy, Joe Gregory, the president. Oh, so he was really pushing this guy up. Well, it took a while, though. It took eight years. He didn't just get promoted and take his boy with him. And the reason he did, in the history of Lehman's, there had been a lot of infighting and hostile takeovers from presidents to CEOs. So he didn't want to have it. So Joe Gregory did have a lot of qualifications. But do you know what his number one qualification was? What's that? He didn't want Dick Fould's job. <laughs> his number one qualification is yeah, Skeletor's minion did not want to be Skeletor. Now, Fould and Gregory, so one's a CEO and Joe's number two. Um, Fooled was the face. He was the one that the, with a brutal schedule. He was on the company jet. He was going to clients all over the world. Um, he was a more comfortable speaker. Gregory was the inside guy. He handled the do- the day to day. Okay. The problem with Gregory, for being the inside guy, the detail guy, he wasn't detail oriented. He believed only in structure. He says, if you hire the right people and you get them on the right story, everything will just take care of itself. It can be a little risky for someone who's supposed to be keeping their their fingers on the pulse. I was about to say, um, that is like the boss who you ask them a, a detailed question, and instead of answering you, they say, you should know this, you were trained for this, and they don't answer anything. Now, I want to talk to you about something that this is the stuff that Fool did. And I think this is, I guess you'd say brilliant. So people say, well, if he's yelling at me, I would just walk out. When he took over and started paying people, his compensation packages were based on as much as 50% of your compensation was stock in the company. And you couldn't touch that stock for five or six years. So these employees were vested in personal wealth in the millions so they can't just run out the door. Okay, so we keep using the metaphor of like the sea captain on the ship. I mean, he literally chained them to the oars, like stock-wise, making half of their pay stock in the company. He is chaining them to the oar. He is making sure that the ship goes down. They know they come with it. Well, and, and, and for 14 years, their 50% compensation went up 25% every year. For 14 years. So that is some golden handcuffs. Right. <laughs> so this guy can be an idiot. He can scream at me all he wants. I'm going to be worth $100 million when this is all done. If this keeps going like it is, he must know what he's doing or I wouldn't be this rich on paper. Right. They're all locked to the oars and they're all thanking him for it. One real, um, real, real red flag, and this all came out towards the end, is how heavily they were vested in real estate. And not only were they heavily invested in real estate, their collateral wasn't as strong as some of the other big financial institutions. A lot of the other people's portfolios were about 25% down um, as far as just equity, equity that they, they put in. Lehman's was a lot riskier. Most of theirs was at 3% down. Okay, so translate that for me. It, if I'm buying a house, I only had to have 3% yeah, of so- what I'm buying? Most of the other investment banks, if you were buying a million dollar building, you would have twenty five, you know, two hundred fifty thousand dollars down. Lehman's was, <laughs> what do you say, thirty thousand dollars down? Change a lot you, less. Yeah, you scrape together what's in the couch cushions. You have the the down payment. Yeah, so when things are appreciating, that's great. Even if they stay the same, but if they dip, you're in trouble. Your whole portfolio is just worthless. I guess this might be the part of the episode where we explain the stock market crash and the housing market crash and why things took a dive in 2008. Um, instead of doing the boring thing and turning this into a hour-long episode about how the crash happened, um, could we watch just the five-minute clip from The Big Short? You, you've seen that movie before? Yeah, I watched it. 50 times. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I probably know this verbatim. <laughs> there is a, a clip we're going to watch. We're going to leave it in our show notes and our links. 
and it is just the clip where um, they they basically explain how the market crashed and uh, what a CDO is. It's a collateral collateralized uh, debt obligation. So we're going to watch five minutes of this and then try to describe to each other what we're seeing. So we're going to pause it real quick. Okay, so if I can try to um, take us through how Lehman works in like a couple of short steps, which no economist can really do that well. Um, Whole classes are taught about this. And at the end of the episode, when we say we're not experts in anything, what we mean is we watched a five-minute YouTube clip about a movie that explains this partially. <laughs> um, I still have saving bonds from my grandmother, for God's sakes, for birthday money. So not a, not a sophisticated investor, <laughs> am I? <laughs> um, so if we go back to the financial crisis, if what you're telling me about Lehman Brothers is true, um, I don't come in and buy a house responsibly i buy a house um you know i have three percent to put down and um i tell a bank hey i've got pocket change um i have a job doing you know i'm maybe a landscaper part-time and the bank is like yeah we'll take your money you can totally afford this house just never miss a payment ever ever seriously ever and um this house is yours so if we are Lehman Brothers, uh, what happens is the bank takes our really, really, really risky mortgage and packages it together with other mortgages. And so they have my time bomb of a mortgage packaged in with, say, my grandmother who has never, ever missed a payment and was a nurse. Well, let's rewind there. So we'll do this. Grandma's 800 credit score. She put half down. It's a 10 year fixed rate. Right. You're a landscaper who makes probably about two grand a month, but the mortgage company told the bank you make seven grand a month on a stated. And then you're also on an adjustable rate mortgage. So you're in six months, the payment you can barely afford now is going to double. Right. So it's even more of a ticking bomb. You got when that when that rate bumps up, balloon rate. Right. I, I came to them with a short fuse and a pile of gunpowder and the bank helped me build this bomb. Um, and the reason why the bank is willing to do that is they're about to sell it. They, they know that once they put it in um, a Christmas package and put a bow on it, they can sell it to Lehman Brothers. Is, am I correct in this? They are. And to be fair, they weren't losing on any of them for a long time. Yeah. So history, which is what they base a lot of risk on, Right. history was good okay so lehman brothers takes this time bomb um they have it wrapped up with real mortgages and then they um they involve the government from what i understand the u.s government decides to take um they invest in this too they take bonds and they they invest heavily in mortgages as do the four other of the big five um, investment companies. So now we have the entire uh, stock market tied up in these garbage packages of mortgages, and this is where we start the financial crisis. We won't get too hard into the synthetic CDOs they talk about in this clip, Um, but basically from my understanding is um, if Lehman Brothers is betting on the mortgages not being a time bomb other companies are buying stocks in lehman brothers and they're effectively betting on the betters not going bust um so this is this is the the shortest way i could possibly describe how the lehman brothers um started this this trend or not started but like they were the biggest investor in this they were the leader of the crash and when I say that Dick Fold was the captain of the ship that first steered us into the rocks, he, um, we'll get into the history of this, but his company was known as the Cat with Nine Lives. They went bust multiple times. Lehman Brothers had, had gone bust before. They had either barely recovered and then came back stronger. Because they control so much of this country's economy, a lot of these big institutions, they can affect the whole world's economy. 
And they did, yeah. The 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 market crash of two thousand eight. It was a global economic crash. But it could have been a lot worse if the government wouldn't have bailed out who it did. The bigger players. Right. And again Bigger waves. Yeah. When we when we talk about Dick Fold being the villain of the crash, um, a member of Congress called him that. Like they literally revert him as the villain. So <laughs> we're not putting that moniker on him. That but, was given to him by, you know, the the government that had invested so heavily in mortgages. The wall that's his Wall Street street name. Right. <laughs> the villain. <laughs> Count uh, Chocula. <laughs> <right>. <laughs> oh, from now on, I'm imagining him in a half cape with a big tall collar. Um, so next episode, we are we are going to learn more about the crash, um, and we're going to talk about where we learn charisma because we want um, whether we decide to be the winning type of charisma, where we smile and give a warm handshake and a hug, and we get people on our side like a movie star. Or if we want to become Dick Fold, we want to be the primal uh, charismatic leader where we yell, get under my banner, we're going to war, and people follow us. Um, and we're going to ask the question, do we even need charismatic CEOs? Like, that kind of sounds like a dumb question, like, of course we need leaders. But honestly, do we? I mean, yeah, everything is... Need, can we just have smart ones? Do they have to be the Navy SEAL, no pain, no gain? yelling in your face or can they just be accountants right. professionals or if we're using the ship terminology what if every ship is uh driven by artificial intelligence and algorithms most of wall street is now led by computers algorithms and stock picking ai why do we have any ceos why do we have any charismatic leaders I thought you were going to say HR appropriate, not party <laughs> monsters. <laughs> I didn't see where you're going with that. <laughs> yeah, we we. Uh, I, honestly, I'll take the AI revolution over um, having to take all of these jerks to to human resources to reeducate them. Um, now, that's what we'll cover next episode. But before we close out today, I actually wanted to ask Todd. Um, Charisma has been in the making as an episode for um, so long. It's it's been the longest episode on our on our dock. Um, we are now at episode eighty, and we are just getting to it. Why did you pick this subject? Why is this near and dear? I used to work with this guy. His name was Jason Fresh, and this is someone I the most charismatic salesperson I've ever worked with, and he was just so engaging. Um, he took a leadership role before he was even a manager. He invented the four-hour work week. He listened to everybody. He befriended everybody. He seemed, time st- st- seemed to just stand still for him. And I just like to be close to him. I like to follow him like that, my desk, desk next to him. I'd like to just learn from him. Okay. I That last part is so important to our Charisma episodes. Somebody you want to follow, somebody you want to be near, somebody you want to learn from. That's what I mean when I talk about how our charismatic leaders are persuasive and informative. And TED Talks and Steve Jobs and all these people we think of as good leaders. That's a lot of what charisma is I'm learning. It's being able to educate people in an interesting way to where you think your life is more enriched after you've talked to somebody. And I think with him too, I didn't agree with everything he did, but I thought, well... You know, that's that's how he operates. I think I maybe even respected his risk taking too, that he was all in, that he was such a risk taker. Which yeah. I think ties to Dick Fold. Boldness. Absolutely. Um, did you watch this uh the video of Dick before the crash? Dick? Actually you wrote an interesting article yourself, uh where you talked about protectionism and pollution. Those are real, the two, two threats. I, I thought so. I agreed with you. Uh, so the moment we started playing this video, um, I'm looking at body language and nonverbal cues, storytelling. Todd points to the bottom of the screen and points out that um, this is a video from 2007 of him meeting with, um, it's called Asia's New Business Giants uh, from the World Economic Forum. 
you would think that every Dick Fold video I've run into about him being a villain and being dragged through the mud after the crash has millions of views. This has um, 13,000 views, 36 upvotes. Todd pointed that out and it made me giggle because I'm like, oh, of course, it's the realistic business leader you know, doing his job. That's boring to everybody. Nobody <laughs> gives a shit about that. It's not as sexy as in being grilled and being called a villain in court. Right. That, 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 yeah. The crash, the, the post-2008 crash of him saying, we're going to eat their hearts, millions of views. Um, so what did you see in that video? Like, what, what drew you to Dick? He seemed like he felt like he was two levels of high of everybody. They're all sitting in the same chairs, the same spot. He was in the middle. He was holding court. Everything had to go through him. A little bit condescending to people and the know-it-all. Yeah. I'm the brightest, most brilliant man that's ever that you guys have ever talked to. That's the feeling I got. Right. Um, I hate to, to just hit the same repetitive button, but he cracks a joke. Um, at, at 27 minutes is where we start. We'll have that video link for everybody. He starts by cracking a joke. He says, and I agreed with you and, and people laugh because somebody just sounded like they were catching him on something. Um, he's got his hands spread, you know, his, his shoulders are back. His arms are wide. He's sitting in a leather chair. He is taking up the entire chair and he's holding his hands wide to demonstrate something, but it, it, it's just open hands, open shoulders, and the way he talks is he is, like you said, he seems like a know-it-all, but that's him demonstrating power, and he is demonstrating warmth. And in an Italian suit that costs more than my car. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so power plus warmth and, and showing, or at least speaking as if he is competent in everything he says. The outrage, of course, Joe, is that these investment banks can be as risky as they want and make bad decisions and, and, and not manage risk if the government's going to bail them out. Right. And the rich people get their money saved. <laughs> right. <laughs> but the poor people actually pay the taxes. <laughs> he can afford to sound like he knows everything because he knows that he has a golden parachute tied to the back of that really expensive suit. And he's been using it for 40 years. <laughs> been listening to the re-engineered you thank you so much for listening to the show you mean the world to us we have a new episode every week you can connect with us at www.re-engineeredu.com that's where we have research links show notes and blog articles for each of our episodes we also appreciate feedback and we love spirited debates we're not experts in anything but we've got an opinion on everything Thank you.